Hello, everybody, and welcome to a fireside chat with two leaders of the Ember Project, Yehuda Katz and Ed Faulkner. My name is Leah Silver. I am on the Ember Core team and one of the folks working on EmberConf, and we're so glad that you could join us today. Uh, if you don't have your ticket yet for the 19th, go ahead and grab one at emberconf.com. There is a ton of amazing content headed your way, and um, we're excited to see you there. Uh, today, we're going to hear from Ed, we're going to hear from Yehuda, and they're going to talk a little bit about what happened in the past, what's happening in the future, um, and some of the thoughts and conversations that go on behind the scenes to help make Ember what it is today and what it's going to be in the future. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to you two folks. Take it away. All right. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. These trying times. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want you want to start by uh, telling me what you're working on today and lately? Uh, sure. So right now I'm still working on the keynote, which is basically all Polaris all the time, which we should talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I am also the other thing I'm working on in the background is a project called Starbeam, which uh, is a funny thing. It's it has two different stories depending on which audience I'm talking to. Um, I'll start with the Ember audience, which is you. Hi, guys. Hi, Ember and Yos. Um, the Ember story is that it's basically like Glimmer 2, or it's like Glimmer 3, in the sense that it is a, an extraction of the reactivity model from what Ember does right now to make it more general, make it less coupled to Ember-specific details, and in general, to take the lessons that we learned from, from Ember and re-envision some of the details. Um, the, that always sat, whenever I say that the first time people are like, I don't understand what the point of any of that is. The point is basically that the process of extracting something into a more platonically ideal starting point helps clarify some details. And in, in particular, one of the things that we really get out of this is a better, a, a starting point for a unification of all the APIs, the helper API, class-based helpers, um, modifiers, um, all those stories uh, that uh, resources that which are coming. Um, all those stories have slightly different APIs or are very different APIs. Um, there's third-party packages that have yet even more APIs, but they all are really talking about the same thing, which is uh, it's a reactive computation of some kind that has a value, maybe has some cleanup code or something mm -hmm. like that. And there's no reason for them to all be so different. Um, the good news is Ember has some, we, we have a manager pattern in our architecture, which allows us to like not have to care if we radically change the API surface. And that's how Glimmer Components was able to exist. So that like that means it's not a big deal in, in some sense. On the other hand, it's like really, it, I've been working on it for like three or four months now. And we have gotten to the point where it really works. Like I, this morning I was like, for a few minutes was writing a database library, like, a, like not Ember data exactly, but more like a Redux flavor, like Ember data library, just built on the primitives and like all the tests are just passing. Right, and so it's it's basically a, a update of what of what Glimmer tracking is to encompass more parts like the modifiers, all those parts of the story, um, and also encompass setup and teardown in a way that uh, is is more rationalized. That's the Ember story. The bigger picture story is that unlike Glimmer, where which was really focused on just that part of the story. Um, the Starbeam story is really focused on trying to make sure it really does work in other ecosystems. Um, that doesn't mean that other ecosystems are going to be are going to be prioritized over Ember. I am I work on Ember and I care about Ember and that is like the most important thing. But maybe we'll talk about this later. A theme of Polaris in general and which started from Octane is figuring out how to make the stuff that we use stuff that everyone else uses, mm -hmm. right? So where where Glimmer, in some sense, Glimmer can't really be used inside of React, except as like a iframe, right? Mm -hmm. a, a logical iframe. Um, it is much easier to imagine using our reactivity library inside of React, but there's a lot of details. Um, mm -hmm. And so part of the work I've done, if you look at the repo, a big chunk of the work is like actually getting things to work with React. Um, React has a lot of like, it has weird strict modes. It has uh, like React will just randomly run your teardown functions at unknown times and a lot of different hooks and stuff like that. So figuring out how to model the reactivity model in a way that would feel natural in React is just a project. And mm -hmm. we're going to do the same thing about for Vue and for um, Svelte. Uh, so I think Svelte we're going to start doing next week. Um, the we is me and Chirag and Tom. Tom who worked on me on, on Ember with me in the first place. And mm -hmm. Chirag, who has been like behind the scenes Glimmer contributor for a few years. 
Um, so we're like we're going to start working on Svelte, uh, uh, Svelte compatibility next week. And just the general idea here is we want to be able to say just like we can say about package v2, which we, we I'm going to ask you about in a minute. Mm -hmm. Like just like just like we could say this is something that makes sense for everyone to use. Um, the Starbeam story is like front loading in some sense. The MVP includes, it really does work. It really does fit into the reactivity models of other systems. Mm -hmm. And one last point is I I have a, I now have a pretty, like I care for, so this is like my non-academic academic project is like understanding reactivity better. And I think that Starbeam has closed a lot of the gaps for me in like explaining what is reactivity. And and we I actually want to make we should talk about this as a dedicated topic soon. Sure. But I'll just plant a seed, which is like there's a meme going around that like React is not really reactive, and I disagree with that meme, and I think I want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any, I, any I have plenty of questions I'd like to ask you about reactivity. Yeah, I mean, like, so um, it sounds like this is a nice uh, attempt at standardizing what what we need for you know not just um, you know. Reactivity goes beyond a function call, right? Like a function call has a, a beginning and an end and there's a return value and then you're done. Reactivity goes beyond that and enhances that to something that has has incremental update, right? And that's really an important foundational piece of what it's got. When I think about a standard like web components, I feel like that's the missing piece, right? For people to actually Confirm. like use web components in anger, they need reactivity that isn't there in the standard. Or any kind of data flow that is not based on strings, I think. Like there's yeah. just no way to pass data around in web components. Yeah. You can build a thing on top of it that lets yeah. you try to do that, but web components themselves only let you pass values as strings right. or imperatively. There's yeah, no declarative exactly. way to pass data. Exactly, right. So it, it does seem like a gap in you know, just like broader ecosystem, whether de facto standards or formal standards, it seems like a gap would be great to close. I think I would, re I want to reframe what you said about uh, incremental updates a little bit, yeah. which is, I think, I think that uh, this is an Ember innovation, but I think it uh, is applicable broadly. A better way to think about it is that you have um, input cell, input storage, mutable input cells or something like that. Like think about the Excel model, right? In Excel, mm -hmm. you have a spreadsheet. You have some things that are just like cells you're allowed to edit and some things that are formulas that you can you can change the formula but you can't you shouldn't edit the formula mm -hmm. right and that whole thing i call the data universe um that's what i'm fine I'm calling in the keynote and that that data universe has no um tear down there's no cleanup there the cleanup is the garbage collector and also there's no output other than like you could ask what the values of the formulas are. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm, I'm going to say what the other side is in a second, but the reason I'm putting the cut there is that the data universe can be understood without understanding reactivity at all. Because mm -hmm. like, you, how do you look at a value? You have to ask for it. Yeah. And the value right. should it's, just be the value. Right? Yes. It's timeless. Right. So it's, it's time free programming. It's purely and that's, referentially transparent. Exactly. And that's what functional programming means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's what people mean so that's like the data universe but then there's a problem which is okay well the output is not a person the mm -hmm. output is a thing that needs to be kept up to date and we what we if we don't have reactivity an answer to that question and this goes back to the old backbone spinning circles demo a thing that you could totally do is just like keep executing the program every single time and every single time you execute the program you get a new dom and maybe you do some tricks there mm -hmm. um but that mod, that uh, sorry. So that that's like that's equivalent to what the reactive system is doing, other than it like breaks your selection state and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. However, what people mean by reactive is that you're doing better than that somehow. Mm -hmm. And in like in my opinion, the way you're doing better than that is that you you your data universe is described in terms of mutable cells, and it's described in terms of formulas or computations, and then. You 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 have a declarative system for saying how to take those computations and turn them into output nodes, right? So the out in, in my my reactive model, the output is a very important thing. It's not just it's not just a it's it's first of all it's not an effect. It's like a lot of people model. Oh, it's like it's so different than console.log. It's it's not that. I think if you model as an effect, you end up having to do a lot of work for no reason, right? So mm -hmm. it's a, an output data structure, which is the, the DOM is is something that is semantically equivalent to polling the all the inputs all the computations that need it but also doesn't do doesn't do that and is declarative right and mm -hmm. i think in this case jsx counts as declarative right the, the declarative means it's it's you say the what and not the how and in this case the what is what it should look like in the output 
and the how is how you get from state to state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And JSX is a perfectly good answer to that, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at like, so that's the model. If you look at, J, uh, at React, right? React has use state and use, I'll just say use state and use reducer are ways of getting mutable state. And then there's like, you could either write computations or you can use, use memo to make like computations with the invalidation rules. And then the output is JSX and the framework, like in all, in, I think every single framework works like this, but the framework is modeling. How do you take that declarative system and actually turn it into an incrementally updating DOM, right? Mm -hmm. the, the important, th the reason I said I want to quibble here is that a lot of people think of the computations in the middle as the same thing as output. Mm -hmm. Right, the computations in the middle, you could literally remove. It's hard to do it in React, and it's, this is a design principle of Ember. In Ember, the rule is you're supposed to be able to remove the annotations. You can remove the add track. If you had a unit test on that class, everything would work because the unit test can't actually be in a reactive output. Mm -hmm. The unit test can just ask what the values are of the computations, and you use getters or you use functions or you use methods or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that the annotations are a layering on top of a normal functional model. Yes. Which might might have to use classes. That's like a confusion. The fact that class keyword exists doesn't mean it's not a function. It, it, it's data oriented, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're using functions and methods to get data. You're not using them mostly to mutate things when you're not knowing that, right? Mm -hmm. So so oh, so there's that, basically that. Um, and then there is another part of the system, which is an output data structure that ha that is logically doing what the unit test is doing, but it's supposed to be doing it automatically in a way that is imperceptible to the human being, mm -hmm. right? And that is an interest. That is a different thing. That is the output data structure. And the reason I'm keeping on harping on this is because it really narrows down what that has to do, right? In, like for example, SolidJS just says everything is a fact, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that even the output data structure is a very generic thing. Whereas, in when I did all the the analysis in Starbeam, the only effect that like everybody ever talks about as an effect is log, right? Log is a, and it, log is a special case. It is an Ember also. Mm -hmm. The reason log is a special case is because Normally, you're, you, it, it doesn't. What happens in between state transitions doesn't matter, right? Normally, right. if you go from A to B to C, yes. like you're allowed to, like we have a thing called action in Ember, and we have something like that in Starbeam, which is like when you click on something, you can just make a lot of mutations. You can look at the output right away. React doesn't let you do that, but Ember and Starbeam do, right? You make mm -hmm. a bunch of changes. If you look at the uh, mutable cell that you mutated, it's changed. That's the that's the unit test rule, right? So you you did all that, and then. Uh, I'm losing my own train of thought. Um, so you, bas basically, you, uh, you you have these actions. You mutate the data universe, right? And then the then you then at some point the the, the thing has to be updated. It has to at some point there's been a lot of transitions in between, right? You yes. made a lot of mutations, yes. Yes. but none of them matter. And this is also a thing RxJS doesn't handle that well, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. you basically yeah. any stream based thing is seeing all the intermediate states, whereas yes. this is saying except for the output. The output is eventually going to reduce all that computation down to a text, a string, because mm -hmm. the DOM is made out of strings, right? So except for the output, um, we don't care about intermediate states. And mm -hmm. that the, all, the reduction of all the things that you did in between into a, a string is a very epic reduction, mm -hmm. right? And um, log doesn't want that. Yes, right? exactly. Log, log actually it, wants to be seeing all the intermediate states. Explicitly point in time, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Um... You know, functional programming gets a lot of, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. It gets a lot of cultural cachet because I, I think there's a certain stage in our development as programmers where it's extremely appealing and it looks like a silver bullet to a lot of problems. Well, I think just um, be more explicit about inputs and outputs that were caught, the bane of your existence is a thing that's important. I, yeah, I find it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, like, I think Excel is a really instructive model that I, I use as a strong analogy a lot of the time. It's definitely the most successfully broadly accessible programming environment in the world. And there's a lot of good lessons there. And, and it's part, a lot of it comes from it being timeless. And yet you can't sweep under the rug the, that problem of, in, like, as soon as your program meets the real world, you can't be timeless anymore. You have to deal with right. mutation. And like, there is just mutation in the world. You, you are not copying your computer every time you write a byte, it's it's mutating something. Right. So. I mean, you can literally make an Excel UI in either Ember or Starbeam that is literally like a tracked array of tracked arrays and like renders and it will be fast. Yeah. Right. I think that's yeah. like a notable. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. I, I also, the, 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 the very last thing I want to say on the this topic is that I think the life cycle has caused a lot of confusion in that in Ember, React, and everybody else, there's like 10 life cycle methods or five or whatever, and it makes it seem like they're all equally important. Mm -hmm. the, there is really only one that really matters, which is cleanup. 
And that is, in my opinion, that's why hooks are successful is that they give you a way of composing cleanup. And that that is like one of the last frontiers for me is making us is like making the reactivity system able to handle cleanup because the thing that's important about cleanup compositions is you have to link things together right normally the garbage structure is good enough mm -hmm. but now you have a you'll need to tear down a web stack or something so you need to connect that thing to something that's going to get torn down which is probably a component and that thing needs to be connected to a parent component etc and glimmer does that already but making that more generic so it's not coupled to like the glimmer template model mm -hmm. is important um and i think if you go back to the excel model that would be, imagine that you could have a, a type of cell that's like a WebSocket or something, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So the cell is actually getting its data from WebSockets. Yeah. That has to be implemented as something that sets up a WebSocket. If you delete that cell, you really want it to tear down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, th I think connecting this back to like day-to-day -day experience of Ember developers, I could think of some very specific examples to relate it, which is that um, you get so much you get so much nice reactivity when you do things in templates that sometimes sometimes we don't have a way historically to always to spell the same reactivity in JavaScript and it causes a, a disconnect right you end up um, not being able to slice your logic between HBS and yep. JS exactly how you would have wanted to because the reactivity story wasn't always unified right and yep. um, I used to have a slide about this point in the keynote the like making it easier to refactor. Yeah. And it is in the Polaris sketch document that is going to eventually become the Polaris RFC. Um, but it, it just, it ended up being like, at some point you have to, it's like, oh, object oriented hierarchies. You have to figure out how to slice it. And it was mm -hmm. just, it, it didn't end up being a slice that yeah. fit the flow. But I, it's an important point that right yeah, now, exactly. like there's not a good way to refactor easily between those two contexts. And like yeah. the goal of Polaris is to close that gap. Including exactly. Tear down. exactly. Yes. Yeah, so spelling out the, you know, it touches on other other areas that are interesting to me and exciting, you know, like the Glint support, the really first class TypeScript support. Um, all of that really requires us in a deep way to rationalize what is the type of the things we say in the handle of our side. What, you know, all the things that you can invoke in a template, where is their, what's their commonality? What's the shared signature? Yep. How are you model? And once you've done that work, you really can model everything as you know, that you've, you're unifying the worlds, right? It's not a yeah. hard split anymore. And I think people think, like people very superficially tend to think that, um, well, like JSX just has a JavaScript expression here and handlebars doesn't. So like, what does that, what does that mean? And I think uh, like, ironically, handlebars picked a much restricted subset in, in intentionally to make it map very nicely onto simple JavaScript expressions and not to allow you to do things like X plus plus, which wouldn't make any sense in a reactive context. Mm -hmm. So it may be in a perfect world, we would have a subset of JavaScript that you could use there that doesn't include things like plus plus or assignment expressions, mm -hmm. but it's just not that hard to map the, the template expressions, the parentheses syntax onto JavaScript calls. And that's more or less what we have done with uh, like the both template tag and being able to put helpers in line is just like making that mapping explicit. And yeah. that, and the glue is basically like between all those things, the rubber meets the road. We, we don't have a lot of spaces to hide cheats anymore. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 Mostly. I got, I got to definitely use Glint with all of the latest, uh, in an actual project to where it was worth it to kick the tires on that, on that stuff. And, uh, it was, it's great. Um, yeah, I've also been, you know, using, we like, turned on the, been using it. you know, just little things also like turning on the polyfill for, um, like helper having a helper manager for plain functions. Now it's just very. It composes very elegantly. It's very yeah, nice. I think it's also worth noting that like one of the things that's nice about the manager concept, which is basically like a helper is like the union of all the helper APIs and all of Ember, but there's only one that exists right now. That system allows us to do things like just turn functions to helpers and have a good, like it doesn't require huge changes in the whole system. It requires a, having a default helper manager. Yep. Yeah. But that's the whole architecture of that. And I think yeah, that's exactly. pretty nice. Yeah, exactly. And the implementation story works out nicely then, right? Like it was all yeah. it was all straightforward to implement third party and there's Yeah, you don't have to go into Glimmer VM and do anything. Right, exactly. Exactly. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I should ask you about embroider. Sure. Tell me about embroider. Yeah, I mean, so that's definitely my open source focus. Um embroiders come really far. I'm really happy with how the level of contributors we have now and the level of apps adopting. Um, you know, Embroider is the next gen build system for Ember. Um, it's really a, um, it's a, it, it's big, it's a big project because we really are doing a, a kind of push and pull meet in the middle thing here. What I mean by that is, um, 
we were we put a lot of work into getting as much compatibility as is as is reasonable but there's at the same time the whole point of this is to get the ecosystem onto better patterns stricter patterns and so there's a bit of a give and take in terms of embroider adoption um and like it's always pretty fascinating when I get a, a new app uh, adopting the kind of bugs that we find right away, um, stuff that you just missed because like the older system wasn't as strict and now you're dealing with more strictness and uh, you get immediate feedback on things that were missed before. Um, things like- What kind of strictness do you mean? Well, like for example, um, some of it is the silly stuff, like for historical compatibility reasons, um, you can mix up your module import with your default import and get away with it in the classic build and all of a sudden embroider starts pointing out all the places where you violated the module spec right or um you know even just stuff like um people using patterns where they're deliberately mutating a module from the outside and that's a spec violation but embroider will catch that at and least yeah so you know stuff like that where there's definitely i, I say it as a give and take because Purely as an as an app author, if you're just like wanting to try it out, all of a sudden it's telling you there's all these problems and it seems like, well, why is my app broken? Well, it's it's really trying to help you get onto standards, get onto stricter patterns, get more correctness. And all of that is in the service of letting us analyze and optimize the app much better. Right. That's why it can split all your code on the routes and all that sort of thing. So um, can, can you talk a little bit about the difference between embroider used as a as a drop and replacement for Ember yeah. CLI's current bundler and the strict mode approach. Sure, yeah. So we definitely, the way we have it set up is when you just install it and follow the instructions in the readme, you're starting out in the most compatible mode that we've got. And um, that covers an awful lot. It's usually not too big a stretch for apps to adopt because um, we've, we've tried pretty hard to keep a lot, a lot of the legacy behaviors behind. Do you, think by the time Polaris, do you think by the time Polaris lands, we will be able to close enough of the gaps that we just say that that's the default mode. The compatibility mode is the default mode for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's my goal is to get to there. I mean, there's just, it's a consensus thing, right? We have to um, like go through the process, get every, like get all the legitimate feedback from the community. We, we've, we've done a few rounds of that already. Like there was an RFC saying, Hey, well, let's make this the default for new apps. And there was some good feedback there. And we could look at that again and say how much of that is addressed and how much of that is in scope or not. Um, there's going to be a, a definitely a long tail of add-on behaviors that are not going to come across. Um, some of them are just things where you could spend more effort and get compatibility. Some of them are just like things we have to say are a bad idea. Um, what's know, an example? What's one example of that? So, um, a big one that people hit is the, um, there's a, there's a hook in broccoli that add-ons like to use the post-process all tree, uh, which effectively lets them rewrite anything at all about the whole application at the end of the build, right? And um, when that's in, so for one thing, we can't really give them a backward compatibility way to run that because the app doesn't look the same anymore. The, the, the input that hook would see after Embroider has built the app is different because we don't generate exactly the same output anymore. That was all implementation detail. That was kind of a bad idea to rely on. Uh, and the kind of thing I mean by implementation detail is that like, there's the assu this assumption that there's going to be one file called vendor.js and a file called your app.js. And that's exactly where all the JavaScript is. And it has this very fixed relationship. The whole point of being able to go to Embroider is you don't want that anymore. You want to be able to dynamically split code. You want a way import to work. You want all these modern JavaScript features to work. And if that's true, you can't just assume that you know that what, exactly what all the JavaScript bundles are, right? There's got to be a bit more flexibility there. At some point in the future, we could imagine having like an optimization, a pluggable optimization step that people can implement, but that's like very, has nothing to do with the thing people are doing now, right? Like you can imagine having a way to plug in something that actually sees some representation of the tree that we did standardize mm -hmm. at, at the very end. So like, for example, maybe you have a CSS optimization step or something yeah, like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you could design a new step to satisfy yeah. that, yes, exactly. And you, but you would that... want that to be, you would want that to be happening at the chunk, like the per, route level, you wouldn't like the yeah. definition of what is the whole app actually has changed and stuff like yes, that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And you'd, you'd want that, to, that step to happen before the final bundling, right? The final, the whole app optimization. You want it, um, or, or just an example. Another is that embroider really, go, because of the, um, 
because of this, the embroider really goes all in on HTML as your entry point. So historically, it's just very implicit is what are the pieces of an Ember app and how do you boot it? It's like you just expect that your build is going to spit out a certain couple of JavaScript files that you then are responsible for putting in script tags in your index.html. Um, a way to think about this is that when you write app slash index.html in an Ember app, classically, that file is when it addresses other files, like you know script source equals, it's addressing output files of the build. And whereas every other kind of interfile reference you author in your app folder is an input file, right? Your imports in your JavaScript are all talking about input world of the files I authored. And they're not talking about output world of what chunk did it end up in, or is it in vendor.js or not? That file was inconsistent. It, it, classically, it talks about output world. I, it really should be talking about input world, right? So if you think about expressing an app that way, now we don't need to have any implicit knowledge about what is an Ember app. The, the rule literally is, here's, some, here's an HTML. If you executed it following the browser standards, that's the Ember app, right? So it's, for example, like, I think, we, we haven't formalized yet and published a V2 app format. Like how will you author an app completely natively with no compatibility backward story? We've been focused more on the compatibility story yet, but that native uh, embroider experience, you, you expect to see, for example, in your index HTML, you know, script type equals module, SRC equals dot slash app.js, right? Like logically that's what you're saying. You're, you're expressing the intent, run my app here. And then- What about app.ts? Sure. I mean, I think that would be acceptable to say that. How I think it, that, how that, that is that's not a browser thing. How does that work? Well, I think that in practice, every and whatever build tool we adopt, um, and a big piece of embroider is not tying our Ember architecture to one, but to make it so that we are able to express our apps in in standards ways. Um, whatever final bundle or JavaScript based tooling you're going to hand off to. I don't think any of them can really take off today if they don't have a story of TypeScript support, a story for you know extensibility. So it's true that um, you we want it, it's deliberate that we want to be able to lean on that um, existing ecosystem investment for these kind of tooling, right? Like for example, if we had to have the story of um, if us and our ecosystem have to do like a you know an order n work to support n popular things that are out there that's expensive and bad but if what we can present is um an an api that is almost entirely expressed in terms of standards and de facto standards an example of a de facto standard would be something like node modules resolving um then when it's time to do all of those integrations all that glue work it's not ember specific glue work right is it correct to say that there's basically two options for index.ts? One of them is, uh, it turns out that there's a de facto standard that a directory containing TS files does something and we'll just, therefore it's fine to treat that as the, as the output format that we're gonna hand off to the bundlers that we support. And option two is, it turns out that that's not true. So we need to do a Ember specific pre-processing step first to turn TS into JS and then we hand that off to the bundlers, but we would prefer not to do that. We yeah. would lean in the direction of doing the first. Yeah, one. we'd lean in the direction of the first one, right? I think because that's where the sweet spot is in terms of um, getting the most bang out of the rest of the JavaScript. But for example, handlebars templates have to do the second one. Yeah, although even there, right? I think if uh, a lot of the refactoring we've done to make embroider happen makes it much easier to implement the handlebars pre-processing under multiple different environments, right? Like the classic way it's done is deep inside of a bunch of Rockly transformations that are right. hard to translate logically into, okay, we'll now do it in Vite and now do it Vite and now do it in, in um, Webpacker and now do it in Snowpack. Um, whereas the transformations Embroider uses are much easier to just drop into those contexts because they're aligned with that way of thinking. Like effectively, a th th customization is okay, like going, I'll say two things about extensibility. One is that it's really important that it's an app author concern and it's not imposed on app authors by the ecosystem of their add-ons. So for example, if um, if every add-on gets to bring its entirely own custom build tool, then you're never going to be able to like evolve. Like, or if, right. if, if, if one add-on uses Webpack and one add-on uses Rollup, yeah. then how do you make an app? How does the app do any yes. kind of optimization? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's not to say that some ad, some advanced add-ons that want to offer build time integrations won't like. If you want to do fancy stuff, 
you may very well be uh, expected to offer your users some kind of utility that makes it easy to plug into the packages that you choose to support, right? Like trying to be completely agnostic, there's certainly like, we can keep pushing in that direction to standardize things. But, but, I, I, but I think there's a, there's a difference between I'm trying to do something in Webpack and I have a transformation that is a one file at a time transformation from yeah. that HBS file to JS, which like really every, logically every single Correct. bundle yeah. supports. Exactly, exactly. So, and that's, that's kind of what I was going to say is the first, does the second part. So the first part was, um, you know, like extensibility and customizability of the build pipeline is okay, but it's an app author concern that you don't want to get imposed uh, imposed magically by the, the add-ons because otherwise it's very hard to evolve it. And the second is um, is what you were saying about like thin transformations, especially file to file transformations, very um, like are much more low stakes and not a big deal, right? Because all of the existing stuff that gets popular kind of has to have them. And nobody can really get popular unless they have a story for how they're going to do these things. Because if you can't, you know, if it can't compile Svelte templates and it can't compile JSX and it can't compile TypeScript, nobody's going to use it. So, like, it's just expected that, like, loader as a concept, not necessarily any one, any specific API, but like, you know, rollups API versus Webpack's API. But um, the general concept of just like, what do I do to this file to make it be a JavaScript module? Yeah. It's like a thing that it's, takes an entry point and then like uses ES imports to follow the next ones and then uses whatever you configured it for file transformations to yeah, process them. Exactly. Like it's a, it's a, there's a relatively natural interleaving point there of like, okay, I've decided I want this file. Please give it to me as a JavaScript module. Right. And that's, I think that's yeah. a low stakes spot to allow customization at the level of apps. Um, so people still get that. It, it's just so, that we don't want to, um, you know, what we have today is much more that, um, every single add-on package can just um, have a completely different idea of how that happens and bring their own, like, you know, add-ons today, when I say today, like, there's plenty of V2 add-ons already today, the classic add-ons, um, they aren't really libraries, they're programs that emit libraries, right? And we would like them to just be libraries so that they're much more amenable to tools that understand JavaScript. Yeah, it seems to me, to correct me if I'm wrong here, it seems to me that the ecosystem has been evolving a lot towards isolated module, like what types you call isolated module mode in the sense that I think a few years ago, it was pretty normal to have tools like TypeScript that would try to do fancy things between modules, but that intrinsically is hard to plug in the way that we're describing. So every bundler has to do like pretty complicated things to support, for example, content enums and TypeScript. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that everybody has moved away from making that mandatory and more, and also eco, the ecosystems have been shying away. So like on balance, a type two developer is less likely to use content enums now and more mm -hmm. likely to think that it's a good practice to use isolated modules mode um, than before. And, and that means that like the one at a time plug, like plugging plugin story is mm -hmm. pretty viable. Yes, exactly. And I, I think it is definitely a trend across all JavaScript. I think it's pushed. I think the web standards themselves are pushing it, right? Because I think I think everybody who works on ES module handling systems is aware that like browsers do more and more of that natively now. And it's nice to lean on that when you can. And once you're doing it in browsers, um, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're, you've given up your, your control over the big graph traversal step, right? You can still, you can still do one-to-one -one stuff, and there's a bunch of strategies for that. And you know, one is that if you just have a web server that serves files that go through a thin transformation one by one when they're asked for, and you and the browser is the loader that does all the module traversal, you get a right. that's good that's your demo from last year's. Yeah, well, I mean, that's like the that's like the Vite snowpack story. And then I mean, I would, and my what I took to last time that I demoed, and I, I've gotten to push um, a little further on some of those kind of things. I'm, I'm still, I'm still very bullish on service worker as a dev tool. That's hundred percent. That's the uh, as second, you know. that's the next piece, right? Which is not even having a web server, but having a service worker. And now, you know, I just um, put together um, working on some, uh, some spike ideas, the, 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 the project where I was using Glint um, and all of that new, nice new stuff. I implemented uh, all of Glint and the compilation it needs in service worker so that you can like interactively make GTS and GJS components and run them in the browser um, and edit them I, and edit them in a Monaco editor and, and live preview them. You know? I think the critical thing there is 
um, if you want to run stuff in Service Worker, you are going to get requests one at a time, and and you will need to, your transformations to run in Universal JavaScript. So mm -hmm. you need you first of all can shed all the ecosystem that is forcing on you um, whole app transformations other than for an optimization step, right? Yeah. It's still fine to do that, but you don't need to do it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you uh, you also need to make sure the ecosystem isn't like gratuitously relying on FS or something. Yeah, you, you, you definitely need. still find quite a bit of that. Yeah. Right. I mean, but that's, that ecosystem is a, is a good, it's a natural yeah. consequence of all of this and hopefully will happen. Right. Like, I think. Right. Yeah. And it's not, it's definitely getting easier. Um, you know, most like I think now the ecosystem it. wants to support it, even yeah. though they don't know that yet totally. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's, I think it's getting on more people's radars and in like the general, you gave the example of TypeScript. Um, using isolated like per module compilation more. Um, I think another example is just how I think s the SAS community has recognized that they need to go to SAS modules, not the classic SAS architecture. And I don't know if you followed that story, but it's it's a similar story, right? It's that um, classically SAS. I, I follow it, but it's very confusing. I, yeah, per, as a user, do not know what's going on. There. Yeah, so like classically SAS is a bundler, right? It wants to do the its own traversal of all of the SAS modules <laughs> and effectively do a, a, a build its own parallel build of all the styles separate from the application. And that's really in tension with a world where apps are you know automatically sliced and diced and delivered incrementally because you really do want you want your styles participating in the same dependency graph as your code, as your JavaScript. And the, the classic SAS model doesn't really do it that way, right? It's a whole separate build with its own graph traversal. And um, if you try to use that mode and like actually build separate mini entry points for all of, say, say every component getting its own styles and you're gonna treat those as separate entry points, um, SAS will do very bad things. Uh, if you're using the classic mode, if you adopt SAS modules, it works more like ES modules where you can express dependencies on things and like common dependencies won't get duplicated. They'll be split correctly. And um, so it is another example, I think of the trend and um, it's there like, it's a, if your dependencies haven't adopted modules, it's, you know, you, you've got to kind of push them to or wait or help, help them to because today it's not always easy. Um, but yeah, it's another example. Okay. I think if, uh, we've been talking a lot about TypeScript, so we can maybe move on to talking about TypeScript, which is another big theme of yeah. all the work we're doing. It came up in both of the things we're saying. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So what do you want? How do you want to talk about it? Well, yeah, I mean, just like, I guess I'd say the high level, um, kind of filling people in on the basic story of where, like, what's been going on lately, because we did just merge, uh, successfully get consensus on a bunch of useful RFCs around TypeScript in Ember as a first class thing. Um, I think that, um, like it has worked in Ember for a long, long time, right? Ember CLI TypeScript is very widely used. I think it's like one of the top. Yeah, Kristen, Kristen had a talk last year at EmberConf about Tilda already migrating to using it and successfully yeah. by annual, by last year. So yeah, yes, it's and, one of the top add-ons. I yeah, exactly. And so like people have been using it. Um, I mean, TypeScript, I think is popular for good reasons. I think there's a lot of benefit to TypeScript if people are, um, you know, unsure, it's, it, I would say it's worth investigating your time into learning. I would al also say like, don't panic. It's not mandatory. Um, like, uh, to something you said to me earlier, uh, like I think we are careful to design JavaScript APIs first and type them. And that, that is really, that is really the TypeScript model of how TypeScript thinks about the world is that it takes, takes your JavaScript APIs as they are, and then explains them. And, as opposed to saying we're going to make a thing that's like where the yeah. JavaScript is a is an implementation detail and it's all yeah, about I, TypeScript APIs. I think it's worth saying like people have experienced TypeScript through TypeScript users a lot and not as much through the TypeScript design designers themselves. And I think it's worth saying that, and, and therefore you experience a lot of like you are doing a bad thing. You the like for example, I would never tell someone that they should make their development server not run not run the code if there's red lines. But it's a yeah. super common thing. And in fact, it's super common for people to see at the question of how do I run, get locking the build? My dev server shouldn't run um, is like a common thing. The answer, of course, is you shouldn't do that. You should strip types in your development server. You mm -hmm. should run it in the browser and your editor should give you red lines. And also mm -hmm. you should have CI and test that determine yeah. that, right? But yeah. it's super common for people to want that because they're used to like the Rust or Java model. Mm -hmm. And it is not a coincidence that that's not required in TypeScript. 
right? Yeah. Ty basically, TypeScript has a bunch of design decisions, including you can run the code when it's it's uh, has red lines, including um, the, a ton of investments that they made in making things like add event listener, taking a string parameter, do something, or um, object dot uh, assign or object that entry is, is like possible to make a type for that. Mm -hmm. um, those are things like Rust could not even, which is Rust and Haskell, which are very advanced type systems, like really can't even dream of the that kind of thing because they they just said string literals are not important, mm -hmm. right? We don't need like uh, we have a very advanced type system, but we don't need to care about string literals, and um, that is an impossible. You cannot do that. You can't write the DOM dot d .ts if you have that opinion, other mm -hmm. than by making it you. Like you let, to be put a very fine point on it, you really want um, some element that add event listener uh, submit, so form that add event listener submit, take an event that has the form on it, mm -hmm. right? And the only way that that works is because it knows that the submit event is a special string that does something special, right? Yeah. And yeah. so there's a ton of work like that that TypeScript has put into modeling JavaScript APIs, and and that's it's not just for legacy compatibility reasons. It is to enable people to make JavaScript APIs first that make sense to JavaScript user and are idiomatic and not don't have a bunch of extra stuff um, that is just for TypeScript. I personally, I find that a lot of other ecosystems, there's a lot of ecosystems that don't care about that. And they end up doing stuff like making you write type assertions everywhere. The angle brackets, like you say like use foo angle bracket some type instead of trying to make the inference system do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And in general, the types of inf inference system is very powerful and with a little bit of your JavaScript hat on, you can figure out how to make an API that feels nice in JavaScript and gives the TypeScript inference or enough information to do the right thing. And in my, like, if you look at my tests for any of my the apps I work on with TypeScript, there's almost no types in them because the inferencer is going to do a good enough job. Um, it, that a, Another example is like, can, there's like the asserts and the predicate functions where you can basically have a function that you call and it tells TypeScript, this is a, this is an element. Or you have a function that calls that tells TypeScript, I'm going to throw an exception if this is not an element, right? Yeah. And then TypeScript can just care about that, right? So these are all details that you could fit into your API design, mm -hmm. and TypeScript wants that. And so, like in the sense that TypeScript has, the probably like the vast majority of the work that TypeScript has done in terms of brain power has been to enable these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it is uh, that's the right way to do it. And so. At basically, all that is to say to a JavaScript, if you're a JavaScript user who is not yet using types and you have not listened to Ed's exhortation that you should look into it, um, you still get a lot of value out of the fact that the types exist. Um, and uh, I, I didn't make that point yet. So there's, first of all, the, the, the first part, part point that I have been making is it doesn't, it doesn't make the API worse intrinsically. You have to do work, but you should do that. Second of all, why you should do it is because JavaScript, they have also done a ton of investment into making the JavaScript language server in VS Code and other editors use TypeScript under the hood, which leans on the fact that red lines aren't breaking the build, right? So basically, yes, you might not have all the information in JavaScript and you might not even get red lines in your editor, but if if you just may say like document.createElementDiv or, 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 or form, then in a JavaScript file, TypeScript knows, or Java, VS Code knows Mm -hmm. without any kind of type annotations at all, that that is a HTML form element. And if you say that thing, that add event listener submit, comma, and you make an arrow function with an E, tab completion on that E in a JS file in VS Code without any special added anything will know that it has E dot form on it and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? So yeah. basically that is like a huge, that is a huge investment that they made. That is not like a thing that falls out of having a type system. and that, what that generally means is that if you take the time to make your API design map onto good idiomatic JS, and and there because basically here's the problem: if you don't do that and you force people to put the angle brackets in their code, a JavaScript person can't do that, mm -hmm. right? So the JavaScript person is going to get an API that just has a bunch of any's or unknowns in it. Mm -hmm. But if you took the time, like in this example of document that create element, to figure out how to teach TypeScript how to get the information out of the JavaScript values, which you can usually do. Then mm -hmm. when you're in pure JavaScript mode, you actually get the right behavior. And that, so that is all why it is our philosophy to do that. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so it's a huge benefit, even if you don't use the TypeScript yourself, like your editor is smarter now about right. what's what's and, going on. And with Glint, if you like hover over a block param, it will tell you the type. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's like a, that is a fault in, in a non, like nothing to do with TypeScript. You're, in, yep. you're using Glint in JavaScript mode. You hover it over, it works. Yep. It tells you exactly. Type. It's very nice. Yeah, totally. 
Um, ah, okay. Yeah, so um, I guess... I we mean, didn't. There's anyway. one little point to make about TS users. We just spent mm -hmm. a lot of time, which is basically, what do you get? Like, what is the point of for TS users? Like, we already have Ember CLI types, so what are we getting out of this? Mm -hmm. The answer, the answer is basically that right now there's a separate project, which is it's not indefinitely typed, I don't think, um, uh, but it, it, but it's a separate project, which means that if you have, if there's a new beta of Ember, it doesn't have the types in it. If there's a pull request you want to try out, it doesn't have the types in it. And so um, there's a one major benefit is like including the types with Ember means that whatever, however you got the Ember source in pull request, it's a branch, it's a beta, it's a canary, it's a alpha build has the right types, the updated ones. Yeah. Um, and and that's and the second important thing is Ember, which is that TypeScript itself does not have Ember, mm -hmm. and and for that reason, Ember style TypeScript does not have Ember other than like trying very hard. Um, and when I say types doesn't have Semver, what I mean is every single minor release has a breaking changes section that tries to convince you that it's okay, but it will actually break your build. And Semver just means if there weren't red squiggly lines before, there shouldn't be any now, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, like not, not that it won't run, it will still run, but yeah. now you have to think about how to restructure your code when right. you upgrade TypeScript. So the, one of the biggest intellectual exercises of the uh, TypeScript RFCs you're talking about is defining a definition of semantic versioning for TypeScript types that narrows what you're allowed to do a little bit um, from what TypeScript lets you do. Um, but it means that we can say that the no squiggly line rule to a first approximation applies if you upgrade from Ember something to something else and you use a version of TypeScript that we didn't already have mm -hmm. when we made the first version of Ember, the upgrade will not cause squiggly lines. That's actually a hard project and it involved, the RFC had a lot of comments from the TypeScript team. Um, and we are planning on making tsember.org its own thing that is useful for people who are not Ember at, per our previous conversation. Mm -hmm. But that that project, basically, if you like Ember's stability story, then it is not then us telling you to use TypeScript. And by the way, that means every time you upgrade Ember or TypeScript, it might create red lines is not is not compatible, right? Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. to figure out a solution to that. And and like if you're thinking it has nothing to do with Ember, you're right. It's just that we did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so if we're ready to switch gears to another topic, I, I wanted to ask, so uh, shifting gears quite a lot, and uh, deliberately so as a contrast with some of this stuff, uh, you know, high level, vision level stuff, um, definitely is something you expect to hear at an EmberConf. Um, but I know that lots of people also focus on the day-to-day the -day nitty gritty of, you know, um, just like basic maintainership. Um, you know, how do I get... Um, like when will this bug? Why is why isn't that bug fi fixed yet? Why isn't that feature done yet? How do I get PRs merged faster? Like the questions of maintainership and, and like how do you keep open source projects moving forward and the tensions there. Um, love to get thoughts on, you know, the basically like the reconciling the different perspectives of uh, a maintainer, uh, a, a a kind of more casual contributor, a user. Um, you know, I, I think there's a tension. I think there's sometimes a frustration on either side of that 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 gap. There's a thing you said to me earlier that I think might be good to lead in with, which is um, the why do people want their pull requests merged in the first place? Yeah, I think like if you want, can you talk? Yeah, about no, it? exactly. Like I think because sometimes you, you definitely hear the question of like why isn't this merged yet? It seems good, and um, I, I would often ask the question back is like, well, remember why you care that it's that it isn't merged, and that's because the code is sitting right there and you could run it if you like it, right? Um, but I think a lot of people instinctively real didn't want to do that. And the reason they didn't want to do that is because they realize it now becomes their problem, right? It's free as in kitten. It's um, something that you have to now take care of. And they recognize that that's a hassle and there's work involved. And so the whole reason you want the PR merged is because you recognize that there's a lot of value in getting other people to buy in with this idea and support it over the long run. And so if it was just about getting the code in place, you wouldn't care so much about the PR merging. You would just apply it to your own fork and go happily on your way. Um, it, the the, the long-term value in, in this stuff comes from the fact that it's being supported. And so the re that's why you care, right? That's why you want your PR merge. But that's the flip side of that is you care because you're asking for something. You're asking other people to adopt and maintain that thing forever. Um, right. which and I think, I think, right. And just to be clear, like one way to imagine doing that is there's just the Ember adopted add-ons repo is just grows without bound. 
and you just keep putting things in there and ostensibly people claim that it's being supported but of course that's not true and that is a way to claim that you're moving the responsibility to the ecosystem without actually doing it right mm -hmm. um another way to do it is to try to synthesize the thing you're trying to do with the thing everyone else is trying to do um in some cases the thing, the thing you're trying to do is a bug fix or a, a small behavior change that most people would agree with and would be willing to pay the migration cost right and that happens a lot in that case your job as a person who's trying to get the thing to try trying to make it not just your thing is to convince everyone that it's either a small thing or it's worth the migration cost and to, and work with other people to figure out what the migration strategy actually is mm -hmm. uh, if there is any necessary um, another thing that you could do is make things more sensible so that the thing that you're trying to do isn't as the like is going to change at a slower cadence mm -hmm. right so maybe like I think liquid fire historically is a good example of this where initially it was highly coupled to ember internals mm -hmm. and over time we worked to make enough ember api so you don't need it that doesn't mean that embers breaking changes don't ever affect liquid fire but they happen like every few years mm -hmm. instead of every release mm -hmm. right so that that's these are all they're basically your framing is is I like it um, mm -hmm. which is basically you're trying to shift responsibility from you also think it's yourself, but it's really like your company or the project. Like you might not work there anymore by the time it matters, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to shift responsibility from yourself to the community, mm -hmm. and it that is not a trivial operation. It is not. It's not. Basically, it it simply doesn't work to do that by just moving it somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to mm -hmm. convince people to maintain it once you did that. Yeah. So now the question is, what is a general purpose structure that we can have in a project that will allow people to take things that are local to their concern and make other people maintain them for them. Mm -hmm. And that better not involve force or something, yeah. right? It, it better involve like yeah. you convince people of something. Yes. And yeah. that, and now you like need to work very hard to, to make most people like the, the savings has to be worth the cost, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to make an environment, a, a, a community and also a project that focuses on there are some things that other projects, like, that some ecosystems can't do at all because mm -hmm. it's like, there is not a good mechanism in our project for making the cost be worth the, making the savings be worth the cost. There's just no mm -hmm. way to do it, mm -hmm. right? So like, that's why things like component manager or, or modifier manager, right? Those things are about taking a look and saying, okay, it is very costly for everyone to, people to maintain a fork of their own component system. Mm -hmm. It is also very costly for us to internally maintain four component systems. So what can we do that if we take a look at everyone, what everyone wants, like what everyone wants is to have um, interoperable components that they could share with each other, but also the ability to customize them in some obscure cases. Mm -hmm. And if since that's what everyone wants, um, the, you will get actually pretty big savings by not making people have to fork. And you will also, but you, it's, it's not worth, if you have to make like five different components in your system, that savings is not going to be worth the cost for a lot of maintainers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, again, if you look at the whole thing, what you have to do is you have to make an extensibility thing that lets the maintainers off the hook from having to maintain five different things and the combinatorial exposure of that, but also get, leaves everyone else off the hook from having to make a fork, yes. right? And that, that's just intrinsic. Like it's, I think it's very cool. I like work. It's like, some some said the cause of my career. Mm -hmm. um, it's like why I work on package managers and like yeah, yeah. composition, right? But I think that is how you have to think about it. And therefore, when you are thinking, why is this pull request not getting merged? It might sound like I'm just trying to talk you out of a thing. Like obviously, you shouldn't. The answer to why is my pull request not merged is not this story, right? Yeah. This story that's very unfair yes. to, to force out people, right? But yes. the reason that the pull request is hard to merge sometimes in a way that's not obvious is this story. Right, mm -hmm. which is you're trying to merge a pull request, and the maintainers, say, and sometimes maintainers are overly conservative and just need some pushback, right? But yes. a lot of the time, the maintainer is saying, "You are asking me to add a new lint rule here, but that lint rule is, I can tell, is a combinatorial explosion with these other lint rules, and even though it wor worked for me, which is one of the worst, the thing I hate the most in any GitHub comment is, <laughs> I, uh, someone says, here's the solution, and then uh, 20 people say, I tried the patch and it worked for me, as, as if that is supposed to mean that you should merge it. Yeah. It is not. You have to check if it actually works, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, so basically, you end up like you have. It is important when you submit a pull request if it's supposed to work for everybody. You need to check that it does work for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. And and also not only and that's that's the easy part. The hard part is like 
it has to work for people in the future if we are not there yet and an ecosystem doesn't exist yet. So you have to have a, th a thought process about how to balance all that. And in some sense, there's overhead that's unavoidable in the consensus and pluralism process. Yeah, but in another exactly, sense, it exactly. better be smaller. It better get smaller over time or people won't, don't have to pay those costs. Yes. And, and at any given three month period, people who don't have to pay the costs are gonna go faster. And if you get like, this is a problem with democracy also, right? If you get bogged yeah. down too much, Yes. in the process of coming to consensus, then it doesn't help you that you have a process of coming to consensus. So that is extremely important. And I think we do a okay, like, okay, as let's say we do a best in class job where best in class just means, I don't know of a better answer really, yes. Yes. of balancing all that. And I am not willing to accept for probably emotional, psychological reasons, the answer of like, it's, it's authoritarianism. Someone just decides. Yeah. I think like that just does, I, my, my, in my head, every time some, I think someone says that to answer something, I'm like, how do you know that person's right? You, you don't, right? So like, mm -hmm. you, you basically need a system that lets more inputs in than the benevolent, like benevolent dictator still means dictator. It just means the person has to benevolently listen to you, mm -hmm. right? You need a system that doesn't require benevolence to get information into the system. Yeah. And that I'm just not willing to accept in any sphere of life parenting, democracy, like government, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my projects, I'm not willing to accept an axiom of, oh, someone just, the answer is whatever that person decided. That's just bad. Science doesn't work like that, right? So yeah, we exactly. just don't do that. Exactly. And I think yeah. that, yeah, sorry. Yeah, me mechanisms of self, yeah, mechanisms of self-correction, right? I, it's yes. making, sure yes, that are, making sure that there are mechanisms of self-correction. And, um, you know, I, I think that it's a very healthy thing in open source for everybody to actually, um, be comfortable with the idea of um, of forks in the sense of temporary and, and soft and proving things out. Um, yeah, I think a lot of organizations make it too difficult. They add a lot of friction and um, a lot of um, it, it's actually quite helpful to um, just because of cadences and, and priorities and organizations with different priorities and budgets and timescales. Um, it's totally fine. Like, and this is, this is, it's not unlike the same reason why we have LTS releases that are a slower cadence than our every six week releases, right? Like lots of changes in lots of projects are going to happen on different timescales and that's totally okay. And one of the, one of the aspects of that is that if there's some, like, if you made a PR that's critical to you, you should run that PR until it gets merged, but you should also not leave it forever, right? Like you should be working in good faith through the process to get it is to consensus so that we can you can stop being a fork and you can get it but I, stream. I think there's an extremely important thing here which is the you can squeeze down these costs by having primitives yeah. it is frequent if you have a fork that you're maintaining and your fork mostly is in terms of a logical primitive that is easy to convince people of but the logical primitive is not in ember so now it's leaking into your whole code base it's pretty easy sometimes to convince people to get Getting at least Ember has tried to structure it in the last few years so that there's less emphasis on the ergonomics of the primitive mm -hmm. and more emphasis on whether it's could be stable and compositional and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can do some of that for like, yes, to a first approximation, you just do forks. But the truth is that you, this whole system only works if you keep paring down the costs of yes. consensus. And that yeah. this is one mechanism that is very important and has proved well for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there is always some cost to consensus and that's actually important, but it, it comes back to the, why do you care that people are merging your PRs in the first place? Right? Like, because there's a value that the, it comes with a value consensus has a big value to it that you're going to now not be alone. Uh, support. But you want to pair out, like basically there's yeah. two consensuses in this case. It's like, what is the composition and there's what should the high level API be? And there's yeah. a deadlock if you try to solve them at the same time. There's irreducible yeah, complexity. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We can often do that. I mean, but this this comes up even at the smallest scales, right? Of just like, um, you know, relatively simple bug fixes sometimes. There could be a whole lot of reasons why um, the upstream well, it's maintainer... Taking time. Yeah, the upstream maintainer is not going to ship it on the time scale that matters to you, right? So yeah. you should totally ship it first. But then, you know, keep working with the community to get it landed. And yeah. and uh, I think, yes, by the way, the TypeScript, the, the TypeScript changes will help here because your fork has types in it now. Yeah, that's a good example of what's good. nice about first class types. Yeah, yeah. I, I, by the way, I want to say, like, I've been noticing as a parent that, like, I have a five-year-old kid and an almost one-year-old. I've been noticing that, like, the world teaches the concept of, like, compromise and decision-making, not the concept of negotiation and 
consensus, even though they are logically the same thing. Like consensus and negotiate, if you even think about it in your with the emotional part, it sounds harder. It's that, now it is harder, but it's not like in the work of it, but it's not a, a more abstract concept. Consensus is like we like in a good day, you say the right thing. You say, OK, you guys should work together, figure out what works best for both of you. Right. Or and negotiate. Leia at like started saying to Jonas, it's basically instead of saying we just like some grown up is going to eventually make the decision here. And you like you just tell us what the story is and we'll figure it out. There's like an actual process of the two people discussing their concerns and trying to figure mm -hmm. out what is a good solution. Mm -hmm. And we are just not teaching that to anyone ever. And therefore, mm -hmm. it's not surprising to me that the process of consensus doesn't feel natural. It feels like like the number of times in a standards body, people are like, why don't we just vote? It's like, well, we don't vote. We, don't, we If we voted, that would mean that one side wins and one side loses, even though there might be a solution that doesn't require that. Yeah. So why don't we first continue looking for the solution a little bit before yeah. we go? And, and yes, it takes a while, but guess what? The people who lose didn't lose that. So that's, yeah. that seems good. Yeah. Like not, not, not good in a moral sense, but good for the process of making consensus useful. Yes, right. Because right. I mean, it's a repeated game too. Like you're going to do it again next time. And exactly. Like yeah. every, every time you lose, you are not actually getting what you need out of this outcome. Yeah. So that basically over time, the outcome is full of things you, that didn't work for you, even though that wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Exactly. So you like, exactly. okay. Uh, sorry. And now you're getting me all worked up. Um, no, that I wanted to. That that's high quality clickbait right there. <laughs> um, is there anything else to talk about? Um, I mean, I know we're getting we're getting a little long of time. We've got other things we could do. I mean, I was curious. You were talking about um, you were talking about a shift in performance measurement strategies toward ah. actual real telemetry on real mobile devices, as opposed to like the what Googlebot used to measure. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I, this is like a thing that is true, but also I discovered it by talking to people who are encountering it, um, for better or worse. Like, I think everyone is forced into Google's view of performance because of Google search, which frankly should be the subject of antitrust and is, but like, <laughs> should like, it's not legitimate that Google is allowed to define the performance metrics for the entire industry simply because of google.com. Mm -hmm. Like that is a messed up thing. And, and AMP literally, which is one of their attempts, is literally in the antitrust lawsuit filed by the DOJ, like mm -hmm. in detail, not like as a sentence, because it's like not good. But anyway, for better or worse, they do get to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, uh, I want to say what is good. Like, so, so what they started to do now, finally, is instead of having an uh, ideation inside of Google, Google headquarters to figure out what they think is a good proxy for performance, which is usually wrong, um, and it's wrong in a whole lot of ways. They are now using Android telemetry to, so there's a lot of Android phones and they are using Android telemetry to say, okay, how long did it in practice take for this website to load on these things? Or if we care about things like interactivity, how long did it take for the page to become interactive on actual devices? Mm -hmm. um, the reason that this, there's a, there's a few reasons why this matters. I think the most, the abstract point is what I already said, which is that it is, it means that being fast or slow is based on reality, not based on a Google metric you have to hit. But mm -hmm. in concrete terms, one of the things that I've been disappointed in around the investment in um, is in my, there's not a lot of investment in warm cash, in, in making the second time someone goes to your website fast. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, so there's a lot of things, what I mean by that is basically, if someone finds uh, LinkedIn.com on Google and goes to it, the first time it's slow, like it's gonna be slow for some definition of slow, but the second time it doesn't have to be slow, okay? Now there's two factors that are making people not work on it. One of them is people look at, when people try to measure whether it matters, they look at warm versus cold cache, but warm versus cold cache is, is not a good proxy for first versus second view because your, the browser will evict your cache for no reason, right? So basically whether or not the, the, whether or not the cache was there or not is a much smaller, Warm cache is a much slower percentage of second hit, basically, mm -hmm. is one issue. Um, I'll explain in a minute why that matters. But the second thing is that both your it's both easier to measure your... So Google already historically has used mostly first, ca first hit metrics. But also, when you are trying to make your own measurements internally, you are like trying to avoid confounding factors. And what does that mean? It means get rid of the cache, mm -hmm. right? Because the cache is a confounder. 
So what you end up doing is you write a script that is testing your performance and it is only ever looking at cold. And then you say out loud in your company, oh, it, well, we, it's, it would be really bad if, if first cache was very slow. So we should, so like too bad. It's like not, that's what we have to focus on. But then, like, but then you have the, the measurement problem where uh, it's like good hard flaw or something, where now that you measured it, that's the only thing anyone invests in, right? Mm -hmm. Even though like you can see logically, there's no point in time where it is good to make this user's experience after the first time faster is disproved. It's not, it's probably there, but for reasons that sound reasonable along the way, the only thing we're actually measuring and convince ourselves is the only thing that's important is first cache. And people will say stuff like, well, if we make the first time faster, we'll make all the things faster. And that's true as far as it goes, but also you could do much better on the second hit than the first hit for reasons that have nothing to do with the first hit. And that mm -hmm. might even slow down the first hit in marginal ways, mm -hmm. right? And in particular, service workers a thing. Mm -hmm. And service worker allows you to um, cache things more aggressively and for better or worse, while the browser happily evicts things that are used far future expires because everyone does that technique, mm -hmm. service worker is, tends to be used more um, intentionally. It's, le it's less likely to be used by a CDN or something. Mm -hmm. And for, for better or worse right now, what that means is that browsers are not evicting the service worker cache very aggressively which means that if you use a service worker that tends to be there, not only that, but service worker has background syncing capabilities, which means that you can not, you don't have to wait until you, the user comes back to your website. In the background, you can get the new version. Mm -hmm. So by the time the user comes, so those are, those are techniques that have nothing to do with like offline mode or anything else that people think is the reason. Every time I bring this up, including to Cluden people, they're like, oh, we thought about that, but we didn't see the point for offline mode or whatever. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about offline mode. The thing I'm right. talking about only right. works if you're online. Right, yeah. but yeah. it allows you to more. It allows you to implement the browser's cache in a way that makes more sense. Yeah, and it has huge impacts on second hit. Mm -hmm. Right, it has huge impacts. Now, the reason I'm saying all that is the good news is when you use Android telemetry instead of like whatever somebody in Google cooked up, the second hit will matter. Mm -hmm. Right, it will actually right. It'll make be a part difference. of your statistics. Yes, right. It, yes. It's part. Of, you can't avoid it. It's actually yeah. there. Right, yeah. and so and now I don't have to make that argument philosophically. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, the frustration I have is, I don't like it's. There's a sense in which you're, sometimes you're just surprised that things capitalism doesn't do, mm -hmm. and sometimes you're surprised that things like the open source community doesn't do. Like there's really no reason. Service worker is old now. Mm -hmm. There's really no reason why a very simple service worker that just caches your assets and then in the background syncs it is not a thing that everyone uses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have any caveats, right? It, uh, it, Every, the reason that we use this service worker is because they have in their head a big list of caveats, but those caveats don't apply to this use case. Mm -hmm. To the extent that they do apply, it's because people didn't work hard, like didn't work on it enough to iron out the bugs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, like maybe there's a lot of details in service worker you have to get right, and you might yes. accidentally um, get stuck on an old version, but that's not intrinsic. Right? Yes, like those are right. things that happen to be true the first time some random person in your company it, yeah, tried to implement it. Definitely another thing where you don't. Again, you, it's much better to have a consensus implementation than to try to build it all yourself. Yes. Right. So anyway, the point of that is to say, I'm just generally disappointed that this doesn't exist. Yeah. But I think there's a very, and I should talk about embroidery, which I think was the, really the original motivation, probably why you asked. But I think getting Android telemetry is a, just an extremely good improvement to the baseline yeah. of what's going on here. I really wish it wasn't happening because Google gets to tell you what to do. And yeah. I really, because Android telemetry is like its own problem, but I'm not the DOJ, right? So I think I'm going to take the win here. Um, I'm going to take the win here and I'm going to say that it is good that we're doing Android yeah, telemetry and totally. concretely that will help here. I think the other the other relevant thing is um, in, it, it is now possible to say, so that's a good positive improvement. It is now possible to say to somebody who is concerned about that, um, embro getting on Embroider and using Embroider code splitting is the fastest way to make a huge impact. And I think people don't really appreciate the size of the impact here um, yeah. because we're not good at thinking exponentially, mm -hmm. but Basically, there is a huge difference between um, my app is just app.js and vendor.js. This I have slides on this in my keynote. There's app.js and vendor.js is what my app is made out of. So if I add an admin section, my admin section is included in app.js. If I add a settings page, it's included in app.js. And even very, very good developer, there's ways to hack it, but almost no one does them, even very good people, yeah. right? And that in practice means that your critical path can't be, op like, even if you're like, oh, maybe I should not use load dash on my critical path. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. There's no yeah. point in caring about that. Right. Whereas, in, like, just the sentence, you should get on embroider and get on like the embroider strict modes. 
-hmm. is enough information to get you have a critical path you can optimize as a real thing yes. just using idiomatic ember like it, the yep. guides the things that the guide tell you yep. this is the thing we have to do in the prior time frame but that's I, I it's hard like it's one of these things that i wish i could say like i wish i could mind meld and make people realize like this is the thing that's good about ember it makes the thing you thought about ember two or three years ago not true about today etc mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but for some reason it's hard but it, but i think it is true and it will make a difference when it lands yeah, um, no, I mean, you've definitely talked about some of the challenges of communicating, you know, the difference between uh, like incremental progress and like high volatility change, you know, um, a lot of the the stuff we ship, um, like when you when you actually look at when when the work starts, when the work ships, there's uh, I don't know. I'm finding the, I'm not finding the right words. Maybe you could summarize better. Like this challenge of explaining, like, what, like it's, slow and steady wins the race yeah. is kind of a, my my thinking on it. It's like yes. you can avoid a whole lot of high volatility missteps that cost an awful lot. And you like going go, like trying to go fast doesn't always make you get there faster, right? I think people have an, do have the intuitive sense of that in a lot of areas of life, right? Like if you, yeah. if you take the time to do things properly, you finish on schedule, you're not slower, you just avoided a lot of mistakes. Yeah, so I think the thing that I find difficult to communicate here, like every year when I'm working on the keynote, I'm like, I find this so hard to communicate. And let me, I wanna lay out what is the, the paradox, then I wanna, you started to hint at what I think is the answer. Um, mm -hmm. So the paradox is if you look at a one year time frame for Ember, it always looks like basically nothing of note is happening, right? So it's like, okay, we started working on Embroider three years ago. A year later, I guess we have a prototype of it. A year later, okay, I guess like somebody could use it in an app, I guess, maybe. And that like two years went by. In the meantime, like in every one of those years, it's like Webpack 6 has come out with new code splitting, special static, and ESM is now, like a lot of things are happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so it feels like, like, well, it's cool that Ember's doing this cool consensus thing, but it seems like it's making Ember go extremely slowly compared to everyone else. However, there's a paradox, which is another year goes by, you're in year three, and now Embroider exists and every Ember app has it and it's on by default. And in the meantime, you went from Webpack 5 to Webpack 6 to Webpack 7, and probably a lot of apps that were on Webpack 5 are still on Webpack 5 and can't use any of the new features. And probably a lot of the, like a React Router is a good example where it's like, okay, we have nested routes because we copied them from Ember. Now we don't have nested routes. Okay, we have nested routes again, right? There's these, wild gyrations that each each instance of it seems like news mm -hmm. but but then i'm sort of getting into this answer but but basically there, there's this paradox which is that we don't think in three-year time frames nor should we make plans in three like we're not going to do the soviet five-year plan that's an yeah. extremely <laughs> bad idea right so it seems like there's a problem here how could like it seems like it's easy to think oh it's a coincidence that octane worked out well it's a coincidence that polaris is going to work out well it's the truth is we could go faster if we just didn't do these, like like what we're doing is these big five-year plans and it's like, by coincidence, it's working out okay, but it's a stupid idea because everyone knows it's a stupid idea and what we should instead do is to think Webpack is doing or React, right? I think that's the paradox. It feels like at any given, when I write my one-year keynote, I always have, except for the one year where we landed the edition, yeah. the things I'm saying are very boring. Yeah. And in the meantime, there's increasing frustration that like some other ecosystems look like things are happening. So why is it so slow? Yeah. But then every so often there's like a thing that is so huge that it surprises even like me and you are very keyed into this point. Mm -hmm. And we're still like shocked at how much Octane got done, right? Mm -hmm. So you like, you look at pre-Octane, it's like ember.logic.extend, it's like NFED. If you look at the output modules, it's like, it's like, um, uh, it's like every uh, the weird component API where you have like classing bindings. It's um, inner HTML, so you need to have elements. It's like all everything's on lifecycle, like so many things. And then you look three years later, and it's like a thing that we felt good about, like the Ember, the Glimmer JS thing is like it seems comp competitive. You might not like it aesthetically, but it's not like ridiculous, right? And mm -hmm. but and I do like it aesthetically, by the way. And we also made like auto tracking system that's like pretty advanced compared to whatever, right? So so there's yeah. this weird thing where along the way, people are getting more and more antsy and need to get some answer for what's going on. And yet after three years, it seems like by coincidence, by mir mir miraculous uh, by miraculous conception, 
somehow we have these big switches. And also, like somehow, miraculously, the transitions work out OK. Right? Even though we have like Octane is much different than classic Ember, somehow, like a lot, like most Ember apps actually transition and get the benefits of Octane. Yeah. And basically, that is the, like, so some, I already know how to talk, like in some sense, I want to talk about that if I'm telling you the abstract answer. What I find very hard to do is to talk about it in a one year time frame because that is the problem. Yeah. Um, I, just, I, the, I think the, the breakthrough I had today talking to you earlier um, was an explanation. I don't know if it helps in my keynote, but it's an explanation that answer some questions, which is a volatility explanation you were um, pointing towards. Yeah. Like if you look at the stock market, right? The stock market, um, if, you, if you look, there could be a starting point and an ending point, and you could have one stock market that smoothly went from the starting point to the ending point, and one stock market that wildly gyrated from up and down and would have high volatility. You could look, the volatility index would be very high. Um, so first of all, I think volatility index is generally considered a bad thing in the stock market. If volatility is high, something bad is happening. And the reason for that is that volatility causes a lot of changes to happen in the world that are then going to be reversed the next day, right? So it's not mm -hmm. good for volatility to happen. There's a lot of reasons, but volatility, it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. You would, for given the same starting ending point, you would like the volatility to be lower if possible. And in the stock market, you, for the whole stock market, we can't really engineer that, but um, it's important to look at Ember. So Ember is, so Ember is social same thing. We have a starting at any point. I think I was give, using classes as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So Ember mm -hmm. decided that we need to worry about native classes the same time as React decided needs to worry about native classes. And then a few years went by and then React, in between React landed experimental classes and then abandoned experimental classes more or less like native. In, like, I don't, I don't know what to say here other than you're not really supposed to use native classes and they don't really work. They don't have, you can't use native classes with all the React features. You can't use hooks in them, right? Mm -hmm. So basically that is an abandoned fork of React that a lot of people adopted in the meantime. And before React actually landed hooks in a stable version of React, we actually landed full support for native classes, which happened incrementally, like a little at a time. We got rid of .get and .set, replaced them with getters and setters. We made, we defined what the constructor is supposed to be. What is the owner parameter? Um, we thought we figured out how to do auto track, right? So we did all those steps, but then we actually landed native classes, not as an aborted fork, but as a actual direction for the framework that you could migrate to with a migration strategy and code mods and everything in the same time frame, right? So right. The, the paradox, the answer to the paradox in that context is you thought that React Line the native classes was a useful, important fact, and it looked like Ember was going slower. But in that particular context, it was not correct. Like it does in retrospect, it's not true because they didn't end up doing that. They ended up doing hooks instead, and you would have been better. Like Ember, what Ember was doing was slowly and steadily, smoothly going from not having native classes to having native classes. And what React was doing was vol was with volatility going from not having hooks to having hooks. Right, so the classes in between didn't matter. The classes in between aren't even part of React going forward for the most part, but they mattered when people were looking at what Ember was doing in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And and it's and and this is not a coincidence. It's not about consensus. It's not about making nice with people. The consensus process is making our design actually something that we can sustain going forward. Yeah. Right. So the the reason React didn't end up with classes is because they didn't want to support it going forward. So the version of classes that landed before Ember's version of classes, which was experimental, was a version that was not the future. It was not it was, you could land it faster because you weren't willing to commit to it. Mm -hmm. The second anyone's willing to commit to it, Ember is just as fast. That's the, that's the weird paradox and that's yes. the thing to observe. Yes. As, soon as, as soon as you account for being willing to commit to something, Ember is just as fast as everyone else. Yes. And I think the problem is that being willing to commit to something, as I said before, you don't teach the kids. It's not part of your cost analysis at all, even though you could convince someone to think hard about it, mm -hmm. but, but it's not purely philosophical. It makes a big difference. Like Star Skylight, which is the app I work on, started in t about 10 years ago with Ember and is currently using Ember with Glint and TypeScript and whatever. And there is literally no app that is not Ember that was created during the same time that is using like NPM packages and and TypeScript and what and like modern classes and modern React things. Like that. That's not a thing outside of Ember. Yeah. And every t every one of these examples feels like oh, well, you, I'm just cherry picking or something. But as a system, the system is 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 saying. We like to move smoothly and smooth the smoothness, just like in the stock market has a value and the value, the a value in terms of your own momentum, mm -hmm. in your own app, not philosophical or nice to have or playing nice. Those are all 
mechanisms that we get to make your app's momentum stable. Yeah. And we, and we and if you look empirically, it's there's only the the cases where you can talk about. I guess there's one last point I want to make, which is you can point to things that we did wrong historically yes. because yes. it was self-correcting mechanism. For example, module unification was a mistake. Mm -hmm. We we spent a lot of time on it. We didn't land it incrementally, and we ended up aborting it. Now we didn't actually ship it. We didn't commit to it. However, that is an example of something where we the process of trying to find consensus in the way that we did that ended up slowing us down inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a thing that happened. However, it over you also need to look over time how many times do we make that mistake, right? And that the the process is self-correcting in some sense. So embroider is not making that error, right? So and and it's not like we it's not a one-time thing, oh modification to embroider. It's like it like the reactivity, like glimmer one was worse than glimmer two, which is gonna be worse than Starbeam, right? And I in general, there are just there's just a question that you have to answer for how do we make this pro how do we make the stability? I guess I'm saying two things. One, empirically, over a big enough time horizon, if you take a starting point and an ending point and compare Ember to anyone else, Ember is competitive. Yes. Like that in, like and and people don't sometimes want to go far enough in the past and, and yes. to decide that that's not justifiable, but it does, you don't have to go that far in the past. That's right. right. That's right. Well, you know, I think this is, it's always a, it is always a messaging challenge, it's particularly in the JavaScript ecosystem, just because with JavaScript ecosystems growth rate, you always have a very large fraction of developers who don't have that history, who don't, who have not, who have never worked on, who've never been responsible for an app for five years. And they want a special case. They want to say, oh, that you have to do weird things because of IE. If they don't realize that it's, it's about consensus and, and commitment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, no, so it's just like, um, it's hard to tell people, you, know, you can't, you have to, sh you, it's hard to give people answers to problems they don't have yet, right? And so um, yep. there's definitely, in the first year of an application, there's a different set of constraints than in the sixth year as the set of, as the whole set of developers eventually well, turns over. There are the same set of constraints, but you didn't realize them yet. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's a good way Commitment still matters. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It, you, it, if you knew, and that's why there's such it's often a disconnect. I think, um, I, I, you know, as fast as, and I think I'm not trying to suggest that um, folks all across the JavaScript ecosystem don't learn these lessons. I think they absolutely do. It's just that by the time one crop of developers has learned it, there's now six times as many developers behind them in the pipeline who haven't yet. And there's just and. Uh, and some of the business models of software development also just encourage this kind of behavior, right? An awful lot of software gets written, tried, and thrown away in two years. Uh, I mean, the news, I think the news model of the world in, like prioritizes volatility. Yeah. Right. I, now I'm saying very abstract thing, but like basically yeah. something as volatile as I have news stories about it. Right. It's easy so, to like, get There's attention. only one news story about Polaris, yes. right? Which is in right. It's easy to draw attention to, to volatile stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and like nobody, like, you, it even isn't that big of a deal that some of the volatility is in the down direction. It's just like, it feels exciting, yeah. right? But yeah. but I think, like, I think I, what I want to say about the distant past is it is relevant that with enough of a time scale from, like, no matter how, like, once you get past, like, two years or something, every chunk of time has, like, a starting and ending point that looks, like, if you draw the straight line, it looks competitive, Right. I think it's just it, like the problem is that if you draw a particular straight line like classes, somebody will have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what I'm trying to claim here is that the end, where our process makes that happen. It's not a coincidence, yeah. right? And so it's useful to note that if you go back 10 years, the line is more than like in the 10 year line is hot, is like exponentially competitive, mm -hmm. right? And if you go, I think approximately something like a three year time horizon for any three year window, you can pick any three year window and any feature. Yeah. basically. And you have to look at our starting point at any point and then look at somebody other framework starting at any points. Sometimes you can't do that because the other framework didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of the three year time horizons, like you can't do the analysis, but for any place where you could do the analysis and you want to say like, what was like Ember's story around um, reactivity? What was Ember's story around modules? What was Ember's mm -hmm. story around promises? What was Ember's story around um, native classes? What was Ember's mm -hmm. like, what was Ember's story around bundling? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, what is the story SSR? Right. Basically, any of these things, if you do an honest to God starting and ending point over a three year time horizon for any of those topics and you compare it to a starting and ending point of something someone's willing to commit to. So Next.js counts, but I am able to use make SSR work manually with React. This does not count. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, and it, next yes is important because it's a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at something someone's willing to commit to, which means your app could still use it four years from now, or even three, right? Mm -hmm. um, then Ember always looks, I, I'm saying competitive, but I think Ember typically looks better, better. right? Yeah. It's just in the one year time frame, there is always the volatility of, of people who are not aiming for stability makes it like the line goes up. Our line doesn't go up. Mm -hmm. Our line is, their line goes up super fast. Our line is going up slowly and their line goes down and our line keeps going up slowly, right? Yeah. And I think that the reason I keep bringing up the three-year time horizon is it sounds like I'm making a philosophical point, but I'm not. Yeah, right? I'm, it's, yeah it's very practical because we, we can't think at big enough time horizons. Yep. But practically speaking, the, the proof is in the pudding and you can't find examples really. Like you can find mistakes that I will just own up as mistakes and will tell you why, how we have avoided making them again in the future. Yeah. But other than those kind of things, which are actually quite rare, even even in MU, it's like, okay, well, like, what is the story with ESM in Node right now? Like, we're we're going to have ended up having, like, basically, Embroider is going to have basically ESM support in Node that is, like, work with export maps and everything, more or less before anyone else is willing to commit to it, or at least at the same time horizon. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that everyone else had, like, Webpack the whole time, it is relevant, like, I actually think something around the bundler story is a mistake that deserves thinking in the yeah. sense that we've probably done something in between, but yes. I still like it, it doesn't take, it's not yeah. a five-year no, uh, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's actually a great example of the, some decisions that we, we took early on before we had the process we, that we've honed since. You know, some got of the decisions in. that got locked, that we got locked into around add-ons in particular um, they didn't go through the consensus process. They chipped fast because somebody wanted them and there was just an energy yep. in a certain area. And um, we didn't have the, the process we have now where we would do a better job of getting consensus around them because I don't think they, they weren't the quality of the designs we ship now, right? We would not have got yep. consensus around them. I think we would have seen, we would have foreseen a lot of the things that lay locked in that were behaviors that we regret. Yep. I have a closing analogy to make here. Yeah, which is that when I was back in the day in ES6 time frame, uh, there were two features that people were working on. There was web components and there was promises. Um, there are more features, but those are the ones I want to focus on. And promises, we needed promises because we were adding modules to JavaScript. I think we didn't end up in retrospect needing them, but we were like, we need async in JavaScript. There's some, it's like important to have it. And so we were going to do it. And also, like the Chrome team wanted web components. Okay, so what happened with prom like what happened with promises is TC39 has this crucible-like consensus process that feels very painful. But in a one-year time span, we went from having no promises at all to having promises shipped in every single browser. So the equivalent of the con that, that there's different reasons to have a consensus process, but in the mm -hmm. web standards, the consensus process is so that you have it in every browser. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that happened. That really happened. At the same time frame, what was happening is the Chrome team was saying, TC39 is a total failure. The consensus process is a total mess. We're going to show you by shipping web components faster. We're, gonna, we're just going to be the Chrome team. We're going to, as an authoritarian, come down and we're going to land this thing. And if yeah. you say you don't like it, we're going to tell you, you can wait for it till later. We're doing it now. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They did that. And five years later, Maybe, maybe now, so it's more than five years later now, but when I looked at five years later, it still didn't land. They went from web components, what eventually became V0 to V1. That took like four years. In the meantime, that was supposedly in service of moving quickly. And yes, you can move quickly if you don't care about other people. Mm -hmm. That is the thing you can do, but you don't only care about other people because it's like a, like I think the Chrome team, because their consensus process is in service of browsers, has the opinion, oh, if we, everyone was Chrome, we'd be fine. But that, but no, that's actually incorrect. Now they're missing important. The, there's other people involved in the web world that have opinions that are being represented by things like Safari and Firefox that are now missing, and that will come up because web developers, including their own team like Polymer and Angular, are going to tell them, hey, this doesn't work out. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so basically, you there's always this like feeling that you have. Some people have it more than others that if you could just put your foot down and get rid of this pointless talking that yes. you can move faster. And yes. it's not, again, it's not just about being nice and having a kumbaya. It's about actually getting all the information in. And TC39 and Ember are both like actually pretty fast at doing that, even though it seems slow. That's, that's the analogy, right? TC I like it. A year, yeah. they were like a year is way too long. Like mm -hmm. a, a year is crazy. We could have shipped in three months. Well, yes, 
Chrome could have shipped in three months and then changed it five times. In the meantime, Safari would have refused to ship it. Mm -hmm. Right? What is the point of that? And I, yeah, yes, no, I think, I think that's a, a really good uh, summary to, to land on. Okay. All right. I will see everybody. I'm going to do my, I'm going to have my keynote uh, yeah. up as the first talk. And uh, hopefully some of these themes will come through in some way. Um, all right. That's it. I think uh, we long, wide ranging, long conversation. Hopefully it was useful for somebody. Yeah. Thank you both so much for your time. Ready. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you all uh, on the internet next week. Reminder that there are nearly free tickets for uh, students and anyone who's unemployed. So if you just have some free time and you want to uh, ramp up your skills a little bit, hear more from some of these folks, we would love to have you. Uh, see you all at EmberCon. Thank you. Thanks.